the endless yeah the the endless incompetence of my zooming is uh approaching comical or pity i'm not sure which it is but hey you know it's a small group we got dr boyd um and uh dr leonard on here sir and uh dr fournier good 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 group um i there's nothing more boring than uh than just a droning on didactic so um i know that dr leonard has treated a lot of lyme patients so please feel free to just ask questions and um clarify interrupt um interject patient cases whatever like please i i really um that'll help all of us and make it pertinent and um and this is a continuation i think i got through about a third of it before and uh, i'll just drone on until about you know whenever we have to cut it off otherwise i have enough stuff to talk about it's an interesting topic you can uh you can um get me fired up on it um and and i will say it's an evolving field and certainly my own approach to it's been evolving over the past uh decade and a half um as i've garnered more expertise from experience and so on and so forth so um but yeah um, the only caveat I'm going to say to Dr. Leonard is, boy, oh boy, and I, I apologize that, you know, in my world, nothing below 18 and fully fully grown exists. So I, I don't um, have a ton of pediatric experience, nor, nor legally can I give comment on it. And uh, But nonetheless, you know, I'll try to, I think I have some comments on here that talk about what to do in kids, but, but I'm certainly so far from expert in that, that uh, I'll admit that ahead of time, but really the pathogen follows the same rules in general for, for kids. So, um, and just to review where we were, this was our gigantic mega outline. And last time I got through, I think the history of Lyme disease and uh, you know where it came from and um, how it was first described and then described as a uh, vector-borne illness and then a spirochete and then et cetera, et cetera. We talked about how it's primarily a, uh, a disease in nature of, of mice. So I think of the pathogen as really living in mice and then spreading from mouse to mouse or mouse to whatever, to deer or mouse to human via um, ticks. And usually it's the little itty bitty nymph that bites us. And we talked about the microbiology, which is unbelievably important and, and, and cardinal part of the education we provide patients. And uh, in, in explaining to them how this is not a bug that becomes antimicrobial resistant, it is um, not a bug that makes proteins, toxins, or other gene products that cause tissue damage. Um, and so those are important things when we explain to patients um, sort of uh, uh, why they aren't necessarily feeling better quickly, because this is mostly immunologic mediated um, pathophysiology. And I think I ended about there. So I'm gonna to try to find that slide and we'll go forward from there and finish up the rest of the stuff. And again, interrupt me, please ask questions. I bore myself and uh, um, I'll just say, Dr. Gilfus, that was a good refresher from last time. So <laughs> I loved it last time, and then it all some of it seeped out. So I oh no, know. that's good. So and and I'll remember, I'll, I'll end it with this recollection that Lyme goes away and it doesn't kill you most of the time. You know, maybe three out of a uh, hundred thousand. So or one out of a hundred thousand, according to CDC. So clinical manifestations. Let's get on to the the good stuff. Um, what are we going to see? What are our patients going to come in with? It? But we need to recognize, you know, I like to generalize this. It reminds me of a spirochete, another spirochete that we talk about happening in stages. And um, we talk about the early localized stuff, early disseminated and late disseminated. That's usually how I write my assessment and plan. I'll say Lyme disease recognized at early disseminated phase, blah, 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 you know, at early disseminated, late disseminated, et cetera. And it helps me understand what I want to do from a therapeutic standpoint. And also it can... Um, let me give some advice on reinfection risk and um, even some advice on uh, on on time frame for improvement. So and the overall punchline is the earlier you recognize this, the more thoroughly that you treat it up front, 
um, the less likely you are to deal with symptoms that persist for a long time, number one, and, um, and then more likely you're to just um, get better altogether quickly. Um, and, and there's a, if there's one benefit, one and only one benefit of being diagnosed with late Lyme disease is you're very unlikely to be reinfected. That's probably not a gamble worth taking. Um, but if just, uh, you'll hear a lot about reinfection for Lyme because certainly, you know, tick prone people, tick prone people tend to continually be tick prone people. Um, because we go outdoors and we cut lawns or we have cats or dogs or whatever. Um, but the, uh, um, the, the risk of you actually developing um, a second course of Lyme disease really depends upon your antibody repertoire. And if you're somebody who has late Lyme disease manifestations, you probably have a heck of a repertoire. It's like you got the ultimate vaccine. And so there are literally no cases of people who had Lyme arthritis who get reinfected. They can get bit again. They can probably get the spirochete injected into them from the tick, but you don't get sick again, which is pretty cool. What you tend to see is people who get an e-migraines rash and get treated, probably never develop a good repertoire of antibodies, and then get bitten again and get another e-migraines or worse. Okay. Now, this was, this was a, a quote that meant something to me when I wrote this sometime in the mid-2010s. I don't know. Um, it was from a movie, and I don't remember what movie, so it's not helpful. But, but I liked it because... Really, the issue with Lyme disease is being precise with language, something I'm not good at. And something that honestly, what one of the take-homes I want you to take from a clinical manifestation standpoint is um, patients are not wonderful at talking about their symptoms. I'm, I'm a lousy doctor at extracting those words in an efficient manner. Um, and pain is a hard thing to talk about and describe, but you know, pain and swelling and blah, blah, blah. So really trying to... Um, pin down the symptoms into a diagnostic word is very helpful because it'll help us um, really clarify what we need to do to that prep patient. So is that pain neurologic in etiology? Is it joint in etiology? And so on and so forth. So it is sort of a detailed, it requires a bit of a detailed extraction of history. I will note that the three specialties that are involved in Lyme care, and this is very interesting, um, uh, and then I've written the, written the guidelines for Lyme and the three groups that are, I should say that a couple groups that I consult a lot for Lyme disease patients um, are neurology, rheumatology, and I guess I don't consult ID because I am, but, but they, we get involved a lot too from the antibiotic choice standpoint. So um, I find it very, very helpful to use a neurology referral sometimes to put these sort of diffuse um, neurologic -y complaints into a nice succinct word. And I'll give you some examples of that as I go along. So I use a lot of ne neurology referrals and rheumatology referrals to sort of um, uh, 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 simmer some precision of language out of um, sometimes some vague complaints. So the e-migrans rash, when it's, when it's obvious, looks like this, but all you really need is something reddish and roundish that doesn't occur immediately after the tick bite. And so remember when a tick bites you and you just, you know, it just got in you and you get an immediate reaction around it. Most of the time, that's a hypersensitivity reaction to the bug's saliva, to the, to the tick saliva. So, but if it hits you, you know, a week down the road or three to, you know, whatever, some odd days, then that's, um, that's more concerning. And all you really need is something red-ish and round-ish. So pink to red in color and round-ish. And the bigger it is, the more convincing. If it's got a clear center, great but um, I've seen plenty of these that don't, um, and they enlarge over time. They can have some symptoms, but they do not tend to be as painful as like a cellulitis, like a group A strep cellulitis is wickedly painful, whereas this is just irritating. Um, now, that, that's, that's the easy one. So what are atypical erythema migraines? Man, the real bummer about atypical erythema migraines is they can look like a lot of other stuff. Sometimes they can almost look bruisey, um, the scariest ones I've seen have looked vesicular. Um, so I, I literally mistakenly diagnosed patients that end up having Lyme disease as having what I thought was early shingles or a herpetic rash. Um, so just keep that in mind. 
And, uh, and if you ever want to just see atypical examples of e-migrans, you know, put that into Google Images and you can see some. So what are the what are the primary differentials of an e-migrans rash? Um, and here's just some examples um, of, uh, you know, roundish, reddish things can be ringworm, so it could be fungal. Um, you can have cellulitis that looks roundish and reddish, but boy, that tends to have a little bit vaguer borders and doesn't really tend to follow that roundish rule as much as more as just a spreading out geographic spread of whatever extremity or body part it's on. Um, and just remember that you can certainly have high V redness inflammation from histamine directly from the tick spit too. And then there is a beautiful mimic of e-migrans. It literally is an e-migrans called STARI. STARI stands for Southern Tick Associated Rash Illness. We do have it in the southern part of our state. All it is is a different microbe, we're not sure which one, that comes from a different tick and doesn't do anything really downstream. And so it's a wonderful mimic of e-migrans. My, my own approach would be, you know, to treat the patient like any migrants, which would mean to treat them, because I, I don't think you can differentiate it. It's just know it exists, know that it exists. And actually, interesting, remember that this concept of starry actually had some political implications at some point in the past 10 years I'll talk about. It's kind of cool. So, and again, interrupt me, ask any questions, tell me stories, whatever you want. The only cool story I have is the my own mistake about thinking somebody had shingles when it turned out they had Lyme. Um, all right. Now you can, as part of the early dissemination phase, you can you can have a flu-like illness. Um, the CDC warns, you know, beware of the summer viral illness that's sort of sourceless. You know, if you get the sourceless summer flu, um, you know, obviously everybody right now gets checked for COVID and you can check for flu and blah blah blah. But remember, the tick-borne illnesses can look that same way. They can give you that cytokiney awfulness of fevers and muscle aches and everything hurts and and stuff like that. Um, and it can genuinely be the only, you may, you may miss the e-migrans or a patient may never see the e-migrans. It could have been on their back of their butt or somewhere that, that you don't see or recognize and you just present with the influenza-like illness. The only caveat is if you have somebody who's very fevery, very fevery, and has labs that are scary, um, remember that co-infection can happen with these uh, oxoides tick bites. So the two major microbes are anaplasmosis and babesia. As far as I know, we have not seen any babesia in West Virginia. That's just, I don't, I don't know of any. Um, but anaplasmosis, we absolutely do see. And it, again, is, it's, a, uh, it's a white blood cell pathogen. Um, and it tends to cause leukopenia, significant leukopenia, and some thrombocytopenia to the point where if you see these patients that are febrile and leukopenic, you might think they have an acute leukemia or something scary. Like, um, so, but just keep that in mind. If you have somebody who's super febrile, the guidelines will say, if you treat somebody for Lyme and they're still febrile for an extra day, really think about Babesia and anaplasmosis, especially if you're not using doxy, if you're using a beta-lactam. Um, so the other thing you tend to see during this early disseminated phase is multiple roundish reddish rashes. So that's the early disseminated um, disease prevent, presents with uh, multiple emigrants possibly. Um, and I've seen a bunch of these. I've seen tons, you know, maybe nine, 10 of them on people. And then um, early dissemination to the nervous system happens and you can just see um, meningitis. You can see um, cranial neuropathies and cranial nerve palsies. And I'll talk more about the neurologic involvement in a second. It's not simply facial nerve palsy. That's the one that usually gets people tested for Lyme, but you can get other palsies. I've seen the, the eyeball cranial nerves, about every other one involved. Um, so the, what I meant by eyeball cranial nerve, that's my bad knowledge of anatomy, uh, cranial nerve six and four. So the extraocular muscle can be involved, et cetera, et cetera. So um, I want to talk a little bit more about this, again, neurologic manifestation. So what exactly can it do? What is common? What is the clinical presentation? What do you see? So it can present with a headache and um, stiff neck and, and present just like a viral meningitis in the summer. Um, it tends to be lymphocyte, lymphocyte predominant, normal glucose. Uh, white cells tend to be 50 to a couple hundred. Um, and patients don't look toxic. They just feel uncomfortable. But if you get an LP on them, you find 
a lymphocytic meningitis. And as I mentioned, you can knock out basically any cranial nerve palsy. A nice way to remember this is spirochetes like the base of the brain. So any spirochete, syphilis does it, you know, Lyme does it. And remember, that's where our cranial nerves pop out is the bottom of our brain and brain stem. The weirdest thing that I have seen more than is reported is odd radiculopathies. Now, I predominantly see these as pain syndromes, but they are reported also in a motor sense of having, having weakness. I, and I saw one a couple, actually about a month ago, where a guy was wheelchair uh, bound. But the way this presents most of the time is a pain syndrome. So, and it's a pain syndrome that if you're able to clarify, tends to be lancinating, radiating pain. The most common area I see it is the neck and shoulder girdle neck and shoulder girdle, sometimes into the hands, but it's also can cause a lumbosacral radiculoneuritis, big word. I, by the way, I got that word from a neurologist who literally wrote that on a patient of mine last week. That was the nice precision of language they provided me. I was like, patient has nerve stuff. And they gave me that word so I could target it more appropriately. Nerve stuff turns into lumbosacral sacral radiculoneuropathy, but it's fascinating. Um, and it's actually one of the initial things that led people to, to understand uh, Lyme was, um, what was, was this radiculoneuropathy. Interestingly, if you do an MRI on people at that point, um, sometimes the nerve roots light up, they enhance. Not always, but they can. Now, I can't say I've ever seen a true encephalitis from Lyme up front. Um, this tends to be sort of the downstream fear. Uh, if you don't treat somebody that eventually they can get sort of a weird actual brain matter inflammation, not just the meninges, and they can get an encephalomyelitis that, that can mimic MS. I'm not sure I've ever seen it. Um, it's super, super rare, maybe a one in a million cases. Now, I have seen genuine peripheral neuropathy, which presents just like a peripheral neuropathy that you'd see with like a diabetic. And... Um, and um, this is late. Again, those tend to be the really late stuff that you hope you never see because you hope you recognize this early and treat it and they don't get there. The other bummer is these late ones don't tend to really get better quickly, if at all. Um, any stuff, any questions on the neuro whatnot? Fascinating stuff, especially the radiculopathy stuff. And again, this is radiculopathies that if you do imaging don't have structural explanation. So you don't have a nerve root, you don't have a disc out. You don't have spinal stenosis. You don't have facet arthropathy. You don't have something, you know, giving you a why. Um, the heart. Fascinating stuff. I love stories. I'm going to tell you a story. There was a young kid who was on a cross-country bike tour um, and passed out in Ohio and, um, and ended up, you know, on, on the EKG, had a total heart block and got sent to Ruby here. And, um, and talking to him, his uh, his bike ride started in Lyme, Connecticut. Like, no kidding. It really did. And um, he made it to Ohio before he got a heart block. And so you can see this is kind of a, it's a semi-early. So it took him about three weeks, which is impressive. As he was trucking on his bike, two weeks. But um, so this is after early dissemination. The heart seems to be one of those organs that is transiently affected. Transiently is the key word. Um, because it goes away, even if even if uh, even if you don't do anything about it, symptoms can be you know related to a a, a Brady arrhythmia most of the time from a heart block. So you can have a hypoactive pump giving you passing out, lightheadedness, shortness of breath, etc. It can also cause an inflammation. So it can just cause an inflammation of the heart. I've seen it make people have chest pain, palpitations, and uh, even spill troponins in the blood. So it can, uh, and, and even cause pericardial disease. So it can be a pancarditis, myo and pericarditis. So the major thing you want to do is if you have somebody in the summertime that passes out or anytime that passes out as a tick-borne risk is do an EKG and some Lyme disease testing and, and take a look. The magic number tends to be a PR interval of greater than 300. Um, admit them because they're impending to potentially um, get the heart block and go from there. So remember I said Lyme doesn't kill with the caveat that it was like killed one in um, 100,000 people or whatever the uh, CDC series was. That when, when Lyme does kill you, it's this. It's from um, the early involvement from cardiac standpoint. And the, the, I guess the good news involved in that is it's rare, number one, to, to get 
severe cardiac involvement. And number two, it goes away as long as we support people with a temporary pacemaker and some antibiotic therapy to go away. So late stuff is stuff you hope you never see um, because you hope you recognize this at an e-migraines rash. You hope you recognize that a facial nerve palsy or lymphocytic meningitis or a radiculopathy or a cardiac involvement or something and got the person treated easier. But there are people who escape, never had any of that stuff, and then can present with just late manifestations. And um, those late manifestations that we need to know about are really arthritic and neurologic, and it's primarily arthritic. So the arthritic symptoms of Lyme disease, I want you to think of when you think of um, um, any, any knee that you're working up for unclear etiology of an effusion or swelling. And so um, the most common differentials I see written in people's charts before they get their Lyme diagnosis is um, structural damage. So there's, there's a concern that X, Y, or Z might have happened, you know, the MCL, whatever, you know, ligamentous damage, et cetera. Um, or sometimes a crystalline arthropathy is in the differential, or sometimes a inflammatory arthritis. These tend to be giant, they're not giant, wrong word. They tend to be um, swollen. So it's an effusion that really gets the attention and turns this into an oligoarthritis and not just arthralgias. So during the acute Lyme, having arthralgias, sort of diffuse arthralgias is super common. This is a gift from the spirochete to you via cytokine activation. You know, the, the, your body's angry, it activates spirochete, spir uh, cytokines, and you hurt all over. That's part of the nondescript clue-like illness. It tends to last a while. But what we're talking about in the late manifestations is literally oligoarthritis. And that's usually how I'll word it in my chart. No evidence of um, oligoarthritis. And, and so it tends to be one or a couple joints and it tends to primarily be um, the knee, but it can be a couple other ones. Um, and, uh, and they swell and they intermittently swell. And that swelling can last for months to, to weeks on end and go away. That intermittent attack stuff is what makes people really think of gout. And so if you think of gout, I want you to think of Lyme. Lyme does not tend to hurt as much as gout. Um, and the white count can be similar, but often a little less impressive with, uh, with Lyme. Um, but you want to, you know, obviously these are people who deserve treatment and it, most people get better without damage. And this is, um, this is a, a nice um, description of a study we couldn't do today. You know, you got to look back in time to see these and back in 97, 87, the rheumatologist that described Lyme also followed some people who never got treated. And um, after, uh, uh, never got treated after any migraines, you can see a lot of people never get anything, but um, a, a good percentage, 50% would have intermittent attacks of arthritis. And these eventually would decrease over time and eventually burn out. And in most people, except for a couple, would not leave long-term joint disability. Now, those numbers look attractive until you meet that one or 2%. Um, and again, these tend to be young, healthy people. So if you have a disease that's as common as Lyme disease and um, can escape being treated in the early phases and uh, can go on to cause um, proliferative synovitis and joint damage in a small subset of people, but just due to the sheer numbers, this, this sucks. So this is one of the reasons we really don't like Lyme. I have had a couple of young people, runners, active folk, whose lives are seriously disrupted by this illness um, when, it's, when it's recognized late. So we, we wanna try to um, you know, not find people like this, but treat them early if we can. And I'll talk about it, treat them. And then, um, the, uh, I'll talk more about this in a second, but there is definitely a certain percentage of arthritis that takes on a life of its own and becomes almost like an autoimmune process. Um, and this we call antibiotic refractory Lyme. And uh, again, this doesn't seem to be, this is not symmetrical, bilateral, many joints like rheumatoid or lupus or some other thing. It tends to be one joint or one or two joints. And um, this certain subset of patients doesn't seem to benefit from antibacterials and might benefit from a visit to the rheumatologist. And they can, in fact, potentially get surgery to help that proliferative synovitis. They can potentially get disease-modifying agents given to them. Um, 
it's a rare patient that has to go this route. And you wouldn't label somebody as antibiotic refractory Lyme until you maximize your antibiotic therapeutics. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. Okay, now this last group of stuff, the late clinical manifestations of Lyme, I'm not sure that I've seen the encephalopathy. Really, really kind of debated if it exists. I think it probably does. But, um, but just think about this. If you have somebody with objective clinical findings along with, um, and what I mean by that is, you know, cognitive changes that are evidenced on neurocognitive testing or, or a physical exam and, um, and an MRI that supports, you know, white matter lesions, et cetera. And um, so it can do that. And um, you can also get, as I mentioned before, uh, a distal polyneuropathy, which is weird. Um, you know, it would look like diabetic neuropathy, and that tends to be. Now, um, as I mentioned, that the sort of really painful radicular disease, that tends to be early on. It tends to be early on. Um, remember, boy, but it wasn't this back in the day. This was back when I didn't think politics could dive much lower, and now it seems like an angel. Um, so there was a, it was a funny debate between Democrats and Republicans as to whether G-Dub had uh, Lyme disease, which is what the Democrats said he had, and they said he was suffering from the long-term cognitive encephalopathy of Lyme, hence his word-finding difficulties, etc. And then the Republicans said, no, man, he had starry. He just had starry, which was a, you know, I guess he must have had knee migraines rash at one point. And uh, I just thought it was funny to watch it play out in, uh, in nature, uh, on politics. Um, so diagnosis is frustrating and probably one of the most challenging parts with Lyme, and that's because you have to use serology. Boo! So anytime you're stuck using serology, you're stuck looking at the shadow of a microbe that might persist for life. Um, and so that's the real challenge. And uh, what you want to do is very similar to HIV testing. You want to look for antibodies to Lyme disease. And if the screening antibodies are positive, you look for more antibodies for Lyme disease with the confirmatory antibodies for Lyme disease. Very similar that we do for other spirochete disease too, like, like syphilis. Okay, so it's check serology. And if positive, check more serology. Again, so that's the screening and confirmation that we talk about. The screening and confirmation has um, um, changed a little bit recently how we're doing it. I'll talk about that. You can't remember this is an interest, intra intraorganismal pathogen. So unless you're culturing with a mouse, you can't. Anyway, you can't you can't culture it really routinely. And PCR is incredibly unreliable due to the low, 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 low burden of microbes. And so in general, don't do PCRs because they they tend to mostly be negative. Um, so it's not helpful. So unfortunately, we check via serology. And serologies, remember why doctors hate serologies is because there's a window period. And if you check too early, you don't find anything. And um, that can happen if you look at an e-migrans phase. So if you look really early on. And sometimes if you kill those spirochetes so early, you never develop seroconversion. And so that's the false negatives. The false positives, remember, um, this is a spirochete and it cross reacts with some other spirochetes, including some of them that live in us and on us. Um, and, uh, and, and, and any autoimmune disease. I mean, I'm talking to the hep C crew here. We know about false positive serologies for ANAs and rheumatoid factors from other immune stimulation from hep C. So we just, no one loves serology, but it's the best we got. It's what we use. So the test does perform well. I've really garnered a ton of faith in the test over the past um, decade since Lyme entered West Virginia population. And it really, as long as you're asking an appropriate question, it provides a reliable answer. Um, and we live in a you know, hyperendemic area. Um, so just remember what's the question you're asking and then you'll probably get a good answer from the serology. So remember, um, don't you don't clinically use um, serology at the level of the e-migraines rash. So when you're seeing somebody with an e-migraines rash, sometimes this, the patient's seropositive, but you should base your clinical decision on your eyeballs and your test from that perspective, not on a serologic test. Now, the public health people, as well as myself, will say, please still get a serology because it is potentially useful. Um, 
to show acute and convalescent, and sometimes even acute positive, and it makes everybody feel very confident in the diagnosis, et cetera, et cetera. So um, this is a big gobbledygook I got from the CDC website that basically says what I was saying. So you do a, a screening and a confirmatory test, a screening and confirmatory test. Now, interesting little thing, uh-oh. Um, the uh, um, there are two forms of antibodies that will always be reported, your IgMs and your IgGs. We, we all remember from biology that IgMs are your early ones and IgGs are your fine-tuned designer antibodies. Important factoid to remember is if you're not asking a question about acute manifestations of Lyme, don't look at the IgM. And so remember what those acute manifestations of Lyme were. They were the e-migraines, rash, possibly. If it's not too early, it's the facial nerve palsies, it's the meningitis, it's the radiculoneuritis, it's the carditis, it's the multiple migraines, it's the viral flu like illness. So, if you're asking, is this clinical presentation of this patient related to Lyme, then look at the IgM. That's fine. But if you're asking a question about arthritis, not arthralgias, but arthritis, only look at the IgG. So by the time someone develops a genuine arthritis or a peripheral neuropathy or some other late neurologic manifestation of Lyme, their complement of IgGs tends to be impressive. Um, it's not uncommon to see a, a high number of immunoblots positive. Oh yeah, I should mention that. So depending upon your particular facility, the confirmatory test nowadays may be a Western blot, also known as an immunoblot, or it might be a second ELISA or a second EIA. Um, either are adequate. They both have good data and good support, okay? So um, I have a preference for the immunoblot uh, because I feel like it gives me more data for me to stare at, um, but, but either are adequate as long as you're doing uh, a screening and a confirmatory test, okay. So some bummers, some other bummers about serology is um, we don't really have any test that shows adequacy of treatment. And this is, boy, is this a problem. And actually this, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on the slide because the number one um, mistaken thing I see with Lyme disease management is, um, is frustration on the part of clinicians that the serology is not better. So I saw a patient a couple of weeks ago who'd been treated for Lyme on and off for the past three years, not because he felt bad, but because his quote, tests were still positive. So remember, it's serology. So if you get a good repertoire of antibodies because your body had time to respond to that spirochete, there's a chance that it's they're going to be positive forever, maybe positive for life. They do sometimes decline with time, but there's no standard interpretation of that. And there's no thing that really ever makes me look at serology and declare them a treatment success or failure. It's unfortunately clinical. And I'll talk about why that's one of the major problems we have. That's one of the slippery slopes of Lyme is we don't have, a, we don't have an RPR. So any of you who've treated syphilis know the beauty of syphilis is you, you, um, you confirm the diagnosis with a treponemal specific antibody, and then you follow the RPR to make sure you treated them successfully. And it's beautifully declines over the course of a year or a year and a half or whatever it takes. Um, but we don't have an equivalent for Lyme. And so we just sort of, they can stay elevated, both the IgM and IgG. And so, um, yeah, that's a bummer. Now, I listened to a lecture in 19, blah, blah, blah long time ago. Never mind. I think it was in the 2000s. It was, it was, I was just turning into a real doctor. Um, it was like, yeah, when I was a resident. And um, he was, and I can't find this talk, nor can I find any support of this statement, but it stuck with me over the years. And the, and the, the speaker said, beware of an expanding repertoire of Western band blots. So what are Western band blots? They're the antibody panel. And say my IgGs were, you know, five out of 10. And then I reevaluated somebody later for some question and they had nine out of 10. You know, that, that makes you question, it makes you scratch your head. But, but the interpretation of that has no valid interpretation criteria. Basically, I'm supposed to interpret them both as positive. Positive. It's one of the reasons that you know, people are moving away from the immunoblot, but I kind of still like it because it gives me a little more data. 
but just know this is a big gray area and leads to some problems, but do not expect your patient's serology to normalize or go away. And again, naturally, that's a good thing. That means people who've developed a good antibody repertoire means that they're gonna have uh, protection if they get bitten again. So, okay. And you can do some other stuff to try to confirm Lyme or, or let, lend credence to Lyme. I, I like MRIs, EMGs. I tend to use my neurology colleagues to help me decide who needs an MRI or EMG, neurocognitive studies, et cetera. Um, now, other stuff, again, this is a reportable illness. So after you diagnose it, if it's positive, um, you're supposed to tell the health department about it. Treatment, uh, treatment's actually kind of easy. Treatment's frustratingly easy, but has a huge caveat I want to talk about. And that's uh, um, the, the time frame for improvement. Um, so really, our the, the goal of the 2020 guidelines of the, the Lyme, uh, oh, I'm sorry, the IDSA and the rheumatology and the neurology guidelines, to basically say use doxy for almost everything. Use doxy. Use doxy if you can. Dr. Leonard can probably fill you in. I mean, I feel like they're even using doxy in kids more and more nowadays, even less than eight. So, but, uh, but I'm not a pediatrician. I shouldn't give advice on that. I still don't know about anybody giving pregnant people doxy, which is uh, probably a bad idea. So doxy has the advantage over beta-lactams. Um, well, it just does. It just straight out does. It, it, not only that, it treats, it treats co-infection. So in case you're one of these unlucky people who gets an anaplasma or something else from your oxoides tick, it'll treat that. But I have um, seen clinically more treatment failures with uh, beta-lactams than I do with doxy. Um, there's also much better penetration into some of the target tissues of concern and early dissemination with doxy. So remember, I, I mentioned that the cranial nerves and the, uh, the, um, the CNS can be areas of early dissemination. And really the low dose of moxicillin and cefuroxine probably, they don't, they don't seem to get there at a really good dose, whereas doxycycline, doxycycline does. Okay. Um, but the overall pipeline is use doxy as much as you can for almost everything with the exception of just a few things. And I'll mention that. So if you can't take doxy, um, then the beta-lactams are okay. Remember, not a first generation Ceph, either a mox or a second or greater generation Ceph. Every once in a while, we get a person who literally can't tolerate any of that stuff. And a zithro is like your last line, but nobody likes going there. I don't know if it works as well. It is listed in the guidelines as an option, but has worse response rates and so on and so forth. Um, I'll talk about when you might need to use IV, but if you're gonna use IV, ceftriaxone tends to be the easy one to give. And depending upon the clinical manifestations, you treat the treat longer. And basically the punchline on that is the later you diagnose somebody or the more significant their manifestations, the longer you treat them. And um, so a lot of neurologic disease I'll treat for uh, late neurologic disease or, um, or uh, joint disease I'll treat for 28 days, whereas some of the earlier manifestations I'll treat with a shorter duration of therapy. And uh, yeah, doxy whenever possible, um, even for CNS disease. So what are the special treatment situations where IV still plays a role? Um, every once in a while, if you have severe CNS disease, I, I will still as a crutch go to IV therapy. Some of the times I've had multiple cranial neuropathies or multiple radicular neuritis. Um, I'll start with IV therapy. Um, doesn't mean you have to commit them the entire time after they get a lot better. You can convert over to POdoxy, et cetera. But I just want to, again, advocate, be careful with CNS disease and using a MOX or the second generation or greater oral SIPs. Um, cardiac disease is now, literally, if you read the guidelines, it says we prefer POdoxy for cardiac disease. But then it says, you know, if your patient has a PR interval that's greater than 300 and they're hospitalized, give them IV until it gets better. And that's the punchline. Just give them IV until it gets better and then switch to PO. Okay. The treatment modality for arthritis is a little more open to interpretation. But in general, start with a 28-day course of doxy. And if they get better, but it comes back, give them another course of doxy. If it doesn't do a thing to them, give them receptor. So it really, what's your next step if you have to retreat depends upon what their response to initial doxy was, okay? Remember I mentioned that antibiotic refractory Lyme? That's where it falls into. Sometimes even after a couple rounds of PO and a round of 
row seven, you get someone who still has a synovitis um, and swelling. And those are the people that we could successfully label antibiotic, antibiotic refractory. So the maximum length of time you could ever treat somebody by a condoned regimen for Lyme is two rounds of pedoxy and one round of IV septraxone. Nothing more than that. Anything beyond that is not condoned by the literature and is getting to voodoo land, which we'll talk about. A um, couple treatment notes treated early and the triple, quadruple explanation marks there. I don't know how many I have. One, two, three, a lot, a lot of explanation points. You have to spend time to discuss with your patient the expectation for time frame of improvement. Otherwise, you will lose that patient to the Neverland of Lyme literate providers, which is a not really a good term. Um, so you have to spend time and, and, and go through that pathophysiology that this is a spirochete that doesn't produce proteins toxins. This is a primarily going to produce manifestations through an inflammatory and immunologic mediated response. You can kill the bug, but to get your immune system to calm down is going to take months to sometimes longer. So it's that important time frame and expectations and communication that we have to do. So that's the education component. The other thing is validation. We absolutely have to, if people come back after we just treated them and they don't feel any better, it's a disappointing encounter and, and uh, disappointing for the patient and disappointing for the provider. And a lot of times we, we want to do more. We're like, man, I got to do something more. You, you should be better. Remember the pathophysiology. Remember that the, it takes time for an immunologic response to resolve. And uh, so what the, in general, I will educate people is, um, you know, if you got diagnosed with early manifestations, you're probably going to get better in weeks to months. If you got diagnosed with late manifestations, you're probably going to take months to years to get better. And the overall improvement does not tend to be a steady, nice decline. It tends to be a sawtooth pattern of I'm getting, I have good days, bad days. So I draw a little, you know, graph on a piece of paper and I say, yeah, this is where you are. This is where you're going to be. And it's a steady improvement slope, but you're going to have good days and bad days. But if you can look back from one month to another, say if you in June, you look back at April and you say, oh, you know what? Yeah, I'm not perfect, but I'm better than it was in April. And if you look from April back to January, you're like, you know what? I'm better in January than it was, you know, and, and so on and so forth. So that, that's the sort of education we have to provide people. Otherwise, it tends to lead to dissatisfaction and disenfranchisement with the uh, medical community, number one. And it can lead them down a pathway uh, that's dangerous and potentially damaging to their health. And I'll talk about that. Okay. There is a weird thing that can happen. I can't say I've ever seen it with Lyme, but uh, if you ever had somebody who had early disseminated disease and you started them on a really potent therapy like IV septraxone. Sometimes people can have almost like a tumor lysis syndrome, but it's like a bug lysis syndrome called the jarich herxheimer reaction. And uh, it just is a transient febrile reaction after you start therapy. No big deal. Doesn't kill you. Prevention scares you, but it doesn't kill you. Prevention. So this is big. Um, you, The CDC used to want us to dress like that. They've sort of given up on it. They're like, nah, you know what? That's bad for your your rep. You don't you don't want to be pulling your socks over your pants and all that stuff. So really, a, a more practical thing to do is to use insect repellents and insecticides and and do tick checks and so on and so forth. So what are the currently condoned currently condoned approaches for um, uh, tick bite prevention? And I literally, you know, these are not medicines you prescribe, but I write them on. A lot of times, we'll write them on a piece of paper for for patients, and I say, get some DEET, get some, get some deep woods off, you know, something with DEET in it and spray that on your skin. That's got to hit the skin or one of these other insect repellents. If you're somebody who's scared of chemicals and wants something natural, you can use this oil of lemon eucalyptus. There's a brand new one out that's called newt catone that comes from grapefruits and cedar trees and smells good. So there's, but, but the punchline is an insect repellent that you want to put on your skin and then a genuine insecticide on your clothes. And the insecticide, the only one that we really have is permethrin to use. And that'll kill the tick, and this will repel the tick. And so if you use a combination of permethrin on your clothes and deed on your skin, it really is gonna make any ticks that get on you either die or jump off for the most part. 
not perfect, but it's as good as we got because we don't have a vaccine. Um, what is this thing here? Oh, this thing's awesome. So the the I'm going to teach you something right now that is not according to the guidelines. So the guidelines say do not send your tick. If you remove a tick, they say just throw it in the trash. Maybe show it to your doctor, but don't test it to see if it has any pathogens in it. Now that's the guidelines. I personally love the data that comes from testing a tick. So a lab in general will not do a PCR on a tick like your own clinical lab, but there are commercial labs. I have advocated people use this one. I promise I have no commercial bias. I just have good experience with it. Um, so it's tickcheck.com. And if you tell people, send your tick in, it, now it costs like 40 bucks if you really want an extensive panel, but it's really cool because they'll tell you they'll tell you some fascinating information. They'll A, give you a sense of how long the tick was attached. B, they'll make sure what the species is. C, they'll, they'll do PCRs on the tick to actually see what pathogens that tick carry. So the guidelines say, don't do this because the data doesn't come back for like a week. And they want you to go ahead and treat a patient if you're worried about an e-migraine's rash. Um, and there's a lot of times because you can find pathogens in the tick that didn't make its way into the human that it can lead to excess concerns. That's what the guidelines say. My own experience is the exact opposite. I feel like most of the time we send the tick off, we find out that it either wasn't, was not an oxoides, was only attached for 12 hours, or doesn't even carry any pathogens. And so it's been one of these things that's really pacified a patient's mind. Uh, if you get a patient with a little bit of financial wherewithal, if they've got 40 bucks to spare, this can sometimes help them downstream. And I love it. It's really cool. It'll also tell you other whatever else that tick bit in its lifetime. So I, I had a really cool one that bit me that also had been feeding on a on a squirrel, which was fascinating. I, th I just thought it was cool. Um, so I like it. Guidelines don't. Um, I do this a lot too. So my patients with Lyme disease, I, uh, who've had a lot of tick bites, I tend to give them a, their own personal supply of doxycycline, just a couple tablets to keep in their closet. And after this is after successful treatment and, 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 and hopefully they've gotten better. And I say, here's a, here's a supply of doxycycline for the next embedded deer tick that you find. After removal, take 200 milligrams of doxycycline. You can abort the whole downstream process. And it's a beautiful concept. For some reason, ticks tend to bite on Friday evenings when there's nobody in the clinic to answer your phone call. So I tend to just give people their own supply of medicine. West Virginia is a hyperendemic state now. Anybody who's having tick bites in this state from an oxoides tick would qualify as um, uh, potentially a valid to, uh, to do this strategy for. Now, the CDC has all these other criteria that like you really want the tick to have been attached for a long amount of time. Um, and to make sure that someone is confirmed as an eye scapularis, I, 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 that's high hanging fruit. Um, I've given a lot of people the liberty to use the doxycycline as they um, judge potentially useful after tick bite removal. But it's a cool idea. Dr. Leonard, you may ask a question, what happens if it's someone they don't want to give doxy to? Um, there's no data, zero data on using beta-lactam. So um, it's a bummer. So for kids, if you're scared about giving them doxy, probably not, but um, but there's no data on using a beta-lactam um, in these scenarios. There used to be a vaccine, um, but it kind of was taken off the market because they said it um, wasn't selling well. There's another whole side of that that people um, were concerned that it was inducing some molecular mimicry and symptoms. I I, I can't find any good non-biased literature on this. And I was not cognizant enough to know what was going on in 1998. So I don't really remember. Um, but at least there was some uh, impending legal, I guess, question marks as to whether or not the vaccine was inducing some symptoms. But anyway, with the guise of poor uh, performance on, a, on the market, it was taken off the market. For humans, I find this is fascinating. For humans, it was taken off the market, but it's still given to dogs, probably because dogs can't complain that their joints hurt after they get it and they don't have lawyers. So, but it's a dog, if you're, you're, you're giving your Lyme vaccine to your dog, maybe your dog's like, damn it, I hurt. No, but I don't know. It's a, um, by the way, it does not cause a false positive Western blot. It causes like a, one of the, one band positive on a Western blot. That's it. I wish we still had the vaccine. 
you can you can do really cool things to your yard. You can like excavate giant areas around your yard and put things that ticks can't crawl around if you're really a paranoid person um, and, uh, and, and uh, you know, trying to keep ticks from your yard. Or you can get guinea fowl, which is by far the coolest thing I've ever, but probably the coolest medical article I've ever written, read, read was um, about the benefit of guinea fowl. And um, there's even a formula for how many guinea fowl you need for the size of your property. I guess they're just beasts at eating ticks. So, uh, and the, the article I thought was awesome. The drawbacks were they're noisy and maybe objectionable to neighbors and their droppings may be unpleasant. I mean, that's a fun article to write. That's awesome. But the good news is they really do. They're beasts at eating ticks. So um, the other animals that get a lot of play for that is turkeys, wild turkeys and, uh, and uh, possums, but I don't think they're as pleasant to have as pets. So the controversy of Lyme, I'm gonna finish up next time, but I wanna introduce it right now. And the issue is the controversy with Lyme can be aborted and prevented with education and validation. And so in general, if you accept and admit to your patients that there are subjective symptoms that they will experience potentially after treatment, and these are real, these are normal, and other patients experience them, and explain to them from a pathophysiology standpoint, this is likely resolving immunologic activity, you will prevent them often from going down a rabbit hole of the chronic Lyme world. Um, and now what tends to persist after treatment of Lyme is, is real. I have 100% become a believer in this. I've seen it too often, but people really don't often feel great after a Lyme infection, even after the objective symptoms go away. So their facial nerve palsy resolves, their emigrans goes away, their fever resolves, their meningitis is better but they still feel like crap. And uh, that feeling like crap is not uncommon, okay? Not uncommon. So I, the first thing I tell people is this, this, this concept of the pathophysiology. This is likely your ongoing immunologic activation and expectations is improvement, but it's gonna take time. And so it's that whole concept of validation and, 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 and discussion of pathophysiology that, um, that helps. Now, that being said, I, I'm proposing a hypothesis that is yet unproven. We really don't understand, but the hypothesis is this slow resolution. Um, and we don't really know what causes post-treatment Lyme, just like we don't know what causes EBV to cause chronic, you know, long-term symptoms after we get it. We don't know what causes post-COVID. A lot of, a lot of um, inflammatory conditions absolutely cause sort of downstream subjective symptoms. And I, I hate the word subjective because it somehow seems demeaning. But it's not. It's just things that we're not smart enough to measure. Um, these are real. They're they're the things that I've really learned to um, uh, really important for us to embrace and um, and go from there. So I, I made this slide a long time ago, and I hate this slide because I don't believe it. I think this is crap. This this used to say that post Lyme disease may not exist, but actually reflect anchoring bias. In other words, it gives people an excuse to complain. I had Lyme, so therefore my hurting is from Lyme's fault. This is, I think, BS. I, I have learned from the past decade and a half of experience that it's um this is probably an incorrect frame of thought that I used to actually believe in. I now, I don't find this helpful to your patients, and I don't think it's true. Uh, I think people really do experience trouble afterwards. Um, now, that being said, one of the most common reasons people don't get better with antibiotic therapy is if you got the diagnosis wrong, so we do have to be really careful not to have false attributions. And that comes down again to that precision of language, know what the diagnosis is, know what our expectations are, we know what we're treating, target the ther therapy appropriately and educate on the slow improvement. What I wanna talk about in next time, if I have a chance, is um, sort of the unfortunate um, alternative explanations given to um, the post-treatment Lyme disease syndromes and uh, sort of the um, opportunistic, unfortunate uh, things that um, some providers will uh, promise patients and potentially do harm. And uh, But I think we can avoid letting people go down this pathway if we just educate and let them know that they're gonna get better just slowly. 
ask me any questions you have. And otherwise, next time I'll, I'll, I'll finish up with a little bit on this one. Any questions from anybody? I, I super appreciate you listening to me babble on for this long, too. So, Thank you so much, Dr. Gilfus, first and foremost. You always do a wonderful job engaging us. And I always love your photos that you have, that one um, you included with the guy pulling up really tall socks. Reminds me of my husband because anytime we go hiking, he always rocks really tall socks because of the fear of ticks. So Mitra, you would be proud of him. <laughs> Mitra, was that was that only after marriage or even before? Even before. Oh, One wow. of the things that made me fall in love with him, I gotta tell you. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure. I thought it was a yeah. Yeah, yeah a common, no, but common post-marriage experience. <laughs> Love it. Thank you so much. Um, we did get a lot of engagement in the chat, so I'll just quickly skim through it. A lot of folks thanking you so much for this helpful didactic and um, that they really appreciate you um, as always. And so Dr. Leonard, I know you had a question a little bit earlier about negative antibody screen with patients who have Bell's palsy. So I'll let you ask that question. Um, I'm sure you'll relay it much better than I will. So I'll turn things okay. to you. So I had a 11 year old female that I followed up from an ER visit um, for Bell's palsy. Um, you know, asymmetric smile, left eye. It was on the left side, <clears throat> but it was clearly Bell's palsy. And they uh, obtained their antibody screen through St. Joe's, um, and the antibody screen was negative, and so. Just listen, and you would consider Bell's palsy to be early disseminated, so they still may not have, or no, we would expect IgM to be positive. Well, it depends. It's it can be it can be it can really hit most people. You're right. It's sort of in the the early subacute, like a couple of weeks down mm -hmm. the road. But I have literally seen it commingle with the e migrants. Like, did this one have an e migrants? Mm -hmm. This patient? Nope. That's the only thing she had. Now, so there would, there's, um, the, yeah, of course, you know, there can be alternative explanation for Bell's palsy. That's, right, that's yeah. one, um, you know, common things are common. Um, did it get better with Doxy? Well, she didn't, they didn't put her on Doxy. So they did yeah. standard Bell's palsy. They did steroids and Valtrex and she's better. I'm okay. sure because <laughs> of the steroids. Yeah. You know, it's a great question. You could collect convalescent serology if she's untreated, if she's untreated, expectation would 100% be that she would develop positive convalescent serology. Otherwise, it could be an alternative explanation with Bell's palsy. Yeah, it, it's funny. We we have gone so far as to make the assumption nowadays that Bell's palsy in West Virginia is Lyme, and that's great. That's, that's yeah. really, a, I'm glad we've gotten there. But um, but we certainly do see cases that are from, you know, unfortunate explanations on occasion. You know, ear infections gone south was the most recent one I saw. Um, it did, yeah. Yeah, with a bad mastoid. But um, uh, but uh, but yeah, it can still be from herpes and still be from zoster, or still be from blah blah blah. But yeah, in that in that situation, if they weren't treated, um, you'd expect seroconversion. Just be aware that on occasion, if you had somebody who gets um started on treatment at the level of an e migrans, and then develops um, I actually saw a kid that did this as a teenager, got an e migrans, got started on doxy, then developed the facial palsy on, on therapy. Um, remember that mechanistically, this is an inflammatory process. Again, this whole concept. And so it's not a treatment failure per se. It's just part and parcel with the whole thing that we have to remember that it's not right. the, it's the, the bug has been there. The bug is induced in an inflammatory response. We need to kill the bug and then wait for the inflammatory response to improve. So, um, but what I, I guess where I was babbling about that one is you can abort the seroconversion if you, kill the bug so quickly that there aren't enough antigens around to 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 induce that um that seroconversion so right yeah. there's there's a talk purpose. about that before too yeah yeah, yeah. There, there's a, there is truly an early line early line there's room for clinical diagnosis so both at the level of um you know the e-migrans or some of the other sort of early neurologic and whatnot so there wouldn't have been anything wrong with sort of labeling that person as like i'm worried about lyme i'm going to treat them and then check convalescent serologies later and stuff like that um, there, your question about steroids is great. Uh, you know, nobody knows what to do with steroids and Lyme. The in general, e even though cognitively, if we talk about the pathophysiology here, we think this is an inflammatory reaction and therefore a steroid should help. The data is preponderance, the predominance of data says don't use steroids for Lyme. 
either mm -hmm. for the facial nerve or for the cardiac conduction abnormalities. That's a, a frequent question from the cardiologist is, you know, should I just give some steroids to help that inflammatory response of the cardiac conduction? So the answer is no. It turns out there's, there's, it doesn't tend to help, which I can't explain why. But, um, and, and again, same for the joint. If you do get a joint that's all swollen, tend to use NSAIDs um, rather than steroids. But great question, man. It's a hard one. Yeah, that one could have literally been non-Lyme bells. Who knows? But yeah. if, you, if you've not treated or grab a, grab a, uh, a follow-up serology. And, and just one other thing, because you do peds so much, uh, the, a, lot of, a lot of times you still see people avert uh, aversion for using doxy in kids. And, I, and I've seen beta-lactams much more frequently fail. Um, the yeah. yeah, I use Doxy all the time and I talk with Dr. Moffat too. And you know, cause I've yeah. had now, I just had my second kid less than eight with Lyme arthritis, big knee That's and soft. it's 28 days. And yeah. I'm like, I'm like, Kathy, are you using doxycycline too? Because I think that's the best. And she's like, yep, exactly what I would do. I said, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. definitely. I mean, the studies in kids are, like the Cipro studies were not great studies. And so it's pregnant moms is where I think mostly they saw it anyway. It wasn't as so much the significant doses that they were given the puppies like Cipro. It was um, pregnant moms is where most of the teeth problems came from with doxycycline too. So again, once they're out, I think we're okay. Beautifully said, man. Now I appreciate you filling that in. And I got, I got Rachel and Angie on the phone. So I mentioned one thing we're singing the praises of doxy. Remember, guys, one of the things that you need to uh, do with doxy is not take it with divalent cations. So, you know, so many people are taking, um, you know, iron, calcium, multivitamins, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you really can decrease bioavailability by commingling doxy with a divalent cation in your stomach at the same time. So you want to try to avoid that if you can uh, with doxy. Otherwise, there have been case reports of therapeutic failures just because they're, you know, they're not absorbed well. Thank you so much uh, for the question, Dr. Leonard. Any other questions or comments from the group? Alrighty, and thank you so much, Dr. Gilfus. Um, I was gonna do a poll, but I might actually do it after your part three next time. So um, oh, thank you. one big poll um, at the next one. So the only announcement I have is um, so the March 9th session, we actually have to cancel because the ECHO team is going to be away out of office um, at a conference. So we're going to be actually canceling that session. So the next time we'll meet is on March 23rd. Um, it sounds so far away, so I'm going to miss you guys, but I'm sure it'll, I'll blink and it'll be can, here. So. Can um, we move that one? I'll be out of town. Oh, really? Oh, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'll actually be traveling. So it's not like I could even... No sort of listen i'll be traveling but yeah no well we will uh, definitely record it i can um, it. make sure the recording is sent to you absolutely and we'll be sending out the slides um i believe at the next um, recap email when uh the part three is completed so you'll get the slide deck as well at that point but um all right any final questions for me i know we won't meet for about a month so and you can always reach out via email so that's good too all right Thank you all so much. Take care. Thank you. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye.